Good morning and welcome to House Human Services Committee. Today is Thursday, March 10th. And uh, this morning we're starting out our conversation on um, uh, continuing work on a committee bill relating to um, opioid overdose response services. And we have sort of a working draft and we have um, asked uh, the Department of Health and um, uh, the Deputy Commissioner Kelly um, Dougherty to come talk to us and maybe share um, um, uh, impressions or comments on the bill and um, any uh, suggestions that they might have. Um, on some level, this is a conversation, but we'll start uh, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner with you. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Dougherty and I am Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking the committee for uh, pulling this together because as you know, um, our overdoses uh, have increased with the co overdose deaths have increased with the COVID um, pandemic. And we are certainly open to discussing anything that might help turn the curve on um, opioid overdoses or overdoses in general. Uh, so would you like me to just sort of give you my initial thoughts and then Absolutely. go from there? Okay, um, so uh, there are a number of things in here that, um, uh, that we would certainly support. Um, there are also a couple of things in here that uh, we have some reservations about. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll start with the items for which we have some reservations. The first one being um, the peer run syringe service programs. This is actually something that the Department of Health uh, really did examine um, over the last couple of years. And um, we feel that the requirements that are in place now that syringe service programs either be an aid service organization, a substance use treatment provider, or a licensed healthcare provider sort of um, ensures that there's the infrastructure and capacity to um, do the work of the program. We also, um, there, we don't believe that there is a shortage of um, availability of syringe, syringes and other associated supplies. And we already have mobile, mobile syringe service units that um, travel to the more underserved areas of the state. So, um, you know, we don't see this as a priority um, and do have some concerns about sort of um, opening that door wider for other providers. Uh, the, um, the other thing that certainly we are not opposed to, but just have had some experience with was the mobile uh, medication assisted treatment. Uh, this is something that was tried uh, before my time. And so I don't have a lot of the specific details, but I know that there were uh, challenges with actually patients being receptive to accessing mobile medication assisted treatment. Granted, that may have changed since I believe it was in around 2005 or so that this was tried. Um, and there were just certainly a lot of logistical challenges with that. Um, so again, um, we could look back at sort of more specifics around what those challenges were and maybe see if the landscape has changed. Um, but I know that it was tried and was ultimately unsuccessful in the past. I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions about those two items. Um, I do. Um, um, one, as it relates to um, operation of syringe service programs, not saying this is a route that we would go down. <clears throat> but if we heard and agreed with you that um, peer um, 
that coming back with a report on peer syringe exchange got, you know, um, was not the way to go mm -hmm. or that you, rather than guidelines, it was a report. Um, would you be okay with um, just section one, which um, of, of the bill, which uh, does not um, identify, <clears throat> that does not limit. In other words, there would, I mean, um, it's still, it would need, the programs would still need to be approved by you under section 4478 and, you know, all the other things. And rather than identify a new program, but just leave it open, would you be um, concerned about that? I, I'm not sure I completely understand the distinction between the what, what's in um, the group. If we did not do section two or okay. section three, but we just did section one. Would you be okay with that? Yeah, I think that we would be okay with that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my next question around the um, over the other. I was just going to say it does it it does give the potential for opening that door a little you know, which was part of my concern. Um, but but don't you have the responsibility of approving approving them? Yes. So I mean, it opens the it gives you more flexibility, right? To um to do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> My um, question about the um, mobile services is, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, are you, are you aware that there is um, about to start a mobile, um, um, a, a mobile service, a mobile methadone? Um, and, and so, I mean, part of that might you know, include, who knows what, I mean, you know, so um, I guess I'm a little um, surprised that we are basing our concern around information that is 15 years old. Right. Um, and like I said, we don't oppose mobile MAT services. I just wanted to make the committee aware that it was something that had been tried and I know that there were challenges. So certainly understand that the landscape may have changed over the last 15 years and are open to um, seeing if it can be successful this time around. And the federal government is supporting this yeah. with grants. So, yeah. so clearly there is some landscape change or some mm -hmm. interest in continuing to do that. But, okay. Um, those are some, well, I guess, um, what are the department's ideas for um, reaching uh, rural Vermont? Yeah, so, I mean, one thing that we've, you know, that has come out of some of the um, flexibilities that the federal government has allowed because of the COVID emergency is the, uh, induction on buprenorphine via telemedicine. So that has helped and there is a significant amount of advocacy at the federal level to keep some of those flexibilities in place. So that certainly helps at least for those folks who are um, uh, starting on buprenorphine. Uh, they don't need an in-person visit necessarily. Um, with methadone, you still do have to have your initial visit in person. So this is something that could help with that. Um, but some of the other flexibilities are around sort of um, take home methadone uh, has a little bit more flexibility around it because of the COVID emergency. And so that is something that would certainly help folks who are, of course, stabilized on their methadone, but um, uh, would allow them to not need to travel 
to a hub site as frequently as before. And we're hoping that these flexibilities will remain even after the public health emergency is lifted. And, um, you know, President Biden actually did uh, mention that in his State of the Union address. So, um, like I said, we're, we're hopeful that at the federal level, those will continue, which will certainly help access, particularly in rural areas. And I apologize, members of my committee may know this more than I do, um, <coughs> is the, <coughs> Are we totally tied to and limited by federal rules as it relates to methadone? Um, uh, are there things that we can do um, as a state um, as it relates to um, whether it's take home or that? The, the take home is really clinically determined. So once someone, you know, the, the clinician, the physician who's prescribing the methadone ultimately can make that decision around, you know, whether someone is stable enough to be able to start taking their methadone home. Um, so, but there are a lot of federal regulations around sort of how methadone um, facilities operate. Um, but the decision on take home is a clinical one. I don't know if there are limit federal limits on how much can be taken home at a time. That's something I would have to dig into a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a question about, is there a possibility of opening more uh, locations for people to, more hubs, I guess you would call them, especially with gas? so expensive right now and people having to travel from rural Vermont down to, you know, in Lamoille County down to Berlin. So is there a possibility right. is the department's interested in, you know, looking into opening more access points? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that is possible. We may need, you know, additional funding to help support those sites, but, um, but certainly that's something that is possible. Does anyone else besides me have questions? You asked them all. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, Deputy Commissioner, please continue. Okay, so um, I would say the the other thing that um, that we uh, have some reservations about is the eliminating the prior authorization for MAT, and this is something that both the Department of Vermont Health Access and the Department of Health have reservations about. Um, we feel that the prior authorization um, put some protections in place, uh, you know, for patients, and we would not uh, like to see that prior authorization be waived. Uh, and then, uh, um, uh, Kelly, we. I'm uh, sorry, Deputy Commissioner, sure. we have a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, good morning. Uh, um, can you provide us with information or do you know information about, um, uh, you know, like what percent of prior authorizations result in a denial? I don't have that data off the top of my head, but I can certainly uh, find that information out, at least for our Medicaid population from DIVA um, and provide that to you. I would anticipate that it's very low, but I, I don't want to, you know, say that without actually seeing the data. Okay. And when, um, could you elaborate a little bit more when um, you said that you feel like it serves as a um, protection for um, uh, people receiving that service? Well, I think just like um, any service for which prior authorization is required, it's, um, just to determine the appropriateness of the care for the patient um, before the, you know, the payer agrees to uh, reimburse for it. So I think it just provides sort of um, uh, a little bit of oversight, I guess I would say, um, that ultimately is there to protect the patient. So 
I guess what I'm trying to figure out is whether it's really about um, monitoring the cost yeah. um, or if it's really about patient access. Right, um, and I think, I think yeah. that um, having that data around, you know, how many are actually uh, denied versus approved will help to sort of illuminate that. And, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. If I may, I, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have the um, data right here from 2021, and there is a total of um, 3,130 prior authorizations were approved and 182 were denied. So like 94.5% are approved. And it's the average wait time is half hour, but the longest wait time is just shy of 12 hours. Um, so I guess my, my question would be, um, you know, the potential protections that could be in place, is it worth it to be having these, you know, over 3000 cases in which people are waiting a half hour to receive their treatment? Um, I, you know, it sounds to me that you know, waiting a half an hour is not, would not present an, a, a huge barrier to accessing treatment. And um, we, you know, we talk with Diva regularly about these issues. So I could certainly um, talk with our partners over at the Department of Vermont Health Access and, um, and you know, get back to you on that. Go ahead. Okay. I, um, I just wanted to add into what um, Dean just said and also our conversations over the break about that half hour. And it was really that these folks have come in and need a workup first. So sometimes that can take an hour to two hours and that's incredibly important. We all know, cause we have to know what the right dosage is and all of those sort of things and that they're ready and you know, all of those things. But then to leave the patient and say, okay, we're gonna go get the prior approval now and give them, and it, it remember it ranges anywhere between a half hour and 11 hours, so I'm correct. Um, that's where we are losing folks to just walking out. And if you figure 94%, is it worth even losing one person who might go out and end up dead the next day? I just don't think it is. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. And like I said, we'll certainly um, look more closely at this with our Diva partners. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Deputy Commissioner, just so that you know, um, we are hearing from them after lunch today. Oh, great. Um, but we have a, and we have a um, question from Representative McFawn. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, could you tell me uh, what happens with that patient, uh, our prospective patient, uh, during that time when the prior approval is being sought? Is there any, any discussion that goes on with them? Is there any counseling, anything like that? You know, I, I think that a lot of that happens when they're doing the initial workup, identifying sort of the patient's needs. And ideally they would be connecting them to recovery services and other services in the community. But I think depending upon the length of that wait for the prior authorization, um, you know, they could wait in the office, but I imagine that a lot of people leave and end up um, then, you know, being contacted by the provider once the authorization has gone through and they can get their medication. So I think it probably varies depending on what that length of time is, but ideally all of our providers would be connecting them with other sort of services to support them in the meantime. Okay, so, so essentially um, they're kind of in limbo for whatever time that wait period takes place. 
Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, as I as I look at the proposal here in Section Four, we really have two strategies that we're putting forward. One is not eliminating the prior authorization, but delaying the prior authorization sixty days to allow folks to get inducted into treatment as fast as possible, find the right dosage, and then be able to get that approval later on. And the other strategy being having medications themselves, having one medication in each class remove the prior authorization as long as it's in line with the FDA. Um, does the department have a, it, it sounds like you don't have a preference for either of these, um, but just wondering what the thought process thought is around delaying the prior authorization, um, knowing that it, the induction period is so important for medically assisted treatment. Right, so, um... You know, I think that um, part of the prior authorization process is just looking at the appropriateness of the treatment for the patient. And I guess I would have to think through the clinical implications of, let's say I get inducted on uh, MAT and, you know, then you know, there's a delay in the prior authorization and for some reason the prior authorization <coughs> is denied. Um, and then what would that do to sort of my course of treatment? So, um, you know, I think I would just have to think through what the potential implications of that would be. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I would also highlight if prior authorizations are only taking a half hour, it really shouldn't be much of an issue if it's 60 right. days down the line versus right up front. Right. Uh, another piece I... Uh, heard from community is this move towards monobuprenorphine treatment, um, especially in addressing the fentanyl crisis and knowing that with the naloxone addition, it pushes folks into immediate withdrawal um, and can actually push people off of maintaining on MAT. Um, and in my understanding, because of the, the preferred drug realm, um, any prescription of buprenorphine is a prior authorization, regardless of dosage, even if it falls within FDA guidelines. Uh, so I'm wondering, how do we alleviate that barrier if we're seeing providers move closer towards prescribing buprenorphine and getting folks on treatment? Um, it seems like we're immediately putting up a wall for them to be able to get access to that treatment up front. Right, right. Like I said, I think that this is something that we can have further conversation about. And I just want to reiterate that, you know, we certainly don't want to stand in the way of people getting access to treatment. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that the appropriate safeguards are in place. So I'd like to be able to go back and have a conversation with our ADAP clinical team, uh, as well as with our um, DIVA partners. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If there are no other questions, please um, continue with areas that you either have concerns with or those areas that you um, don't. Sure. Um, so um, I want to highlight the services for justice involved um, individuals. We certainly um, support, uh, you know, uh, developing tailored uh, interventions for that vulnerable population. And we actually already do work closely with corrections um, in terms of when people are transitioning out of incarceration and into the community. Uh, our 12, uh, recovery centers across the state already serve justice involved individuals. So I would be curious if the committee is um, uh, thinking about sort of a standalone service for these folks or whether it's something that could be, you know, directed to, you know, additional resources directed to our existing recovery centers to help uh, sort of maybe enhance that work that is happening. So, you know, certainly support the concept. 
um, but just curious how much flexibility there is in um, implementing that. I'm going to turn to um, the team, Representative Whitman. Great. Yeah, thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, Commissioner Doherty, our intention in drafting this language was to be flexible um, about how these could be awarded. We know that there are um, both existing organizations uh, throughout the state interested in doing this work. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are uh, recovery centers. Some of them are not recovery centers, but doing um, different capacities. We know that um, there is a need for, um, a, well, at the same time, it's not across the board. Uh, how do I put this? Um, there are some capacities in some parts of the state that are not uh, happening across the board. Uh, like for example, um, direct services to people um, while they are incarcerated. So bringing uh, those recovery uh, services um, to people um, while they're there. And so I think that this could be um, the way that we've drafted it. It could be one organization. Um, it could be multiple organizations. It could bolster what an existing organization already has. Um, and but it's not necessarily a recovery center. It's not necessarily, you know, we've just kept it flexible as written. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, if I might add to that, um, it was <clears throat> at this point in the drafting, <clears throat> it has been our committee's um, proposal to leave that decision to you, to the department as to where it is best um, um, directed. Um, there is some <clears throat> um, there is some concern from an organization or from an individual that wants to um, start a, um, a, 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 pro a particular program. And I, I wanna say we thank that individual or I do for bringing the idea um, and the need to at least me. And um, they of course would like um, it to be specific to them and to not have an RFP process. Um, and um, because they have experience and all of that. And um, as you may know, um, or if not you, um, David Englander may know, while I do like to tell the health department what to do, we do like to um, <clears throat> acknowledge your expertise. Mm -hmm. And um, this was something where um, we would we would like to give you um, the uh, the authority. Thank you, and we would certainly look as broadly as possible um, at this. So, um, I think the only other comment that I have is, um, you know, we are open to the um, overdose prevention site working group proposal. Um, you know, that's certainly something that um, I know is a hot topic of conversation right now, particularly in the Burlington area. And, um, you know, we would not oppose uh, that group and um, looking at it further, building upon the work that was done by the Opioid Coordination Council, um, I think it was about four years ago at this point. Uh, when they did had sort of a study group on that. And, um, you know, again, looking at what, you know, what has changed in the landscape since then potentially. Um, and like I said, at the, at the start, you know, we certainly want to look at all opportunities to help address our overdose crisis. So I, I don't think that there's anything else that was really, um, that really stood out. Um, but happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And we are working on the, um, the language of, the, um, of that study. And um, what we discussed it yesterday and decided we perhaps needed to massage it a little bit um, and uh, would love to have your feedback on it, of course, yesterday, uh, just to, to let you, um, um, 
in case anyone is unaware, today is Thursday, and um, we we will be um, making decisions about our actions on this bill by the end of the day tomorrow. Right. I think that um, one of the takeaways from the study group uh, that convened a few years ago was that there was a perceived challenge with um, an overdose prevention site in a rural state like Vermont. You know, they've seemed to have worked um, or where they've, you know, operated, um, have been really in like inner cities where there's a critical mass of, of people. Um, and I know that folks are looking at this uh, for, the, for Burlington. Um, obviously our largest uh, city in Vermont, uh, but just wondering how that would work with people traveling from other places to utilize an overdose prevention site and then, you know, leaving there and traveling. So whether there'd be a critical mass of people to sustain such a facility in Burlington. Also, you know, any potential legal challenges, of course, would have to be um, would have to be worked out. And so, maybe, um, so, I mean, maybe if we were identifying what that committee needed to look at, <clears throat> one of the questions would be: Is there a critical mass, or right. however one, um, however one frames that? Right. <clears throat> because you raise a question. Um, and I will also just highlight that Burlington is not the only area in the state of Vermont that is yeah. exploring and has done yeah. significant yeah. research into overdose prevention sites. There's also the consortium in Southern Vermont that partnered right. with right. Northeastern Law School um, right. to do a very extensive report on uh, the barriers on the legislative and mm -hmm. local levels. Yep. Thank you, uh, Representative Small, for pointing that out. Um, Representative McFawn. Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner, could you just um, I don't think I got everything that you just said about there's something going on in Burlington. There is a, a group that is um, that has formed to really look at the possibility of an overdose prevention site in Burlington. It grew out of the Burlington um, Comstat group, which is a group that uh, formed several years ago to look at the opioid crisis in the Chittenden County area and kind of develop solutions. So there's a subcommittee that has come out of that group that is looking at um, the potential for that in Burlington. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Are there any other areas of the state that are doing something similar that you know of? Well, the one like Representative Small said in the, in the Southern part of the state um and you don't I had, know about that, is that right i'm sorry you didn't know about that until just now yeah i didn't know spe the specifics about that about that group but i know that there are other places that um at least have mentioned it i don't know if anyone has gone as far as convening a group um anywhere else in the state okay thank you mm-hmm <clears throat> Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could quickly review. There's six initiatives that looks like to me in this bill. And I know you covered several of them, but could we go through each one and say sure. whether you were, you were uh, uh, shall I say, <laughs> opposed or have questions about it? The so first one, expand the locations in which organized community-based needle exchange programs can operate. Right, and I spoke to that one in the beginning around, we would have some concerns about sort of opening the door to broaden the types of sites. And we um, feel that there is sufficient access to syringe uh, supplies across the state. And there's also mobile exchange programs. So, um, so that was something that I had highlighted that we had concerns about. Um, certain certainly open to like uh, Chair Pugh mentioned doing, you know, looking into that and, you know, doing a report um, 
on that, but that's something that we have looked at closely within the health department over the last uh, couple of years. And the second one requires the Department of Health to develop guidelines for peer delivered syringe exchange. And you said that you, my recollection is you weren't supportive of this. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And uh, in uh, a short sentence, can you say why you're not supportive? Well, I think that the requirements that are in place now that the organization be an aid service organization, a substance use treatment provider, or a licensed medical provider sort of ensures um, that they have, it's kind of a proxy for organizational capacity and infrastructure. Um, and that coupled with, you know, that we don't feel that there's a need to broaden that scope. Um, that there are adequate services in place. I think um, those two things combined sort of, you know, make us feel that the, that opening that door is not necessary and maybe um, not wise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Doherty, um, if I may just, um, Few questions. One is to just, you said that you looked into um, peer delivered syringe exchange, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, what you found. Um, in a little bit of our research, we saw that, you know, these could be sorts of like programs embedded within an AIDS service organization, you know, just an, an additional facet or capacity um, for outreach. So could you just talk a little bit more about um, your reservations on this? Yeah, well, they are already embedded in AIDS service organizations. And, um, and so um, we are actually doing a pilot right now to add outreach workers to the current syringe service programs, which could help sort of um, reach more people. And we, that's certainly that we, something we could look at expanding statewide. Um, but, you know, it was, within ADAP and our HIV STD um, Hep C program that those program folks really looked at whether um, there was a need to expand beyond those entities. And um, the conclusion was that, that it was not a need and we felt that, um, that having those parameters in place um, ensured that the services were provided in an adequate way. Yeah, um, so it kind of feels like we're talking about two separate things. One is, um, you know, whether or not the existing organizations are adequate, and the other is uh, sorts of this additional capacity for peer delivered syringe exchange. You just said that there's outreach workers. I kind of think of those as potentially synonymous based on who you hire to be the outreach worker. and. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, have you developed guidelines for these outreach workers, or is it just something that you're working with the syringe service providers on? It's something that we're piloting right now. I don't know the extent to which there are written guidelines at this point, but certainly they could be peer outreach workers. The distinction is that it would that the organization is not a peer-run organization. They're embedded in existing SSPs. And again, it's just a pilot at this point, but depending on how that goes, we could certainly look to expand that um, to other existing SSPs in the state. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I've been a legislator for a long time, and I think one of the first bills that I reported on the floor of the House was the bill to allow um, needle exchange. And um, so it is something near and dear to my heart. <coughs> and I've been confronted this year with looking and relooking at legislation that I was involved in writing and how perhaps it needs to change with the times. And um, many, many years, you know, and so um, while I um, know and understand 
the um, immense and incredible role that the um, aid service organizations have had in um, syringe exchange programs. I also know that the largest syringe exchange program is not an AIDS service organization. And, um, and we heard testimony yesterday that, that while it is based in Burlington, um, it has individuals coming to Burlington because the other um, places are not and things like that. And I get, um, I'm, I'm getting nervous, I'll say, that we are looking at, let's continue what we're doing and not looking at other, um, and I have to say, and I like what we're doing, <laughs> you know, um, I have some, um, but I, you know, it's like, it's time, I think it's time for us to, to not hold on and go, let's keep doing exactly what we're doing and let's keep funding exactly who we're funding. Um, and yes, let's perhaps keep doing that and, what else can we do? Um, because as you began your presentation, your um, testimony today, you said, we have a problem. We have a huge problem in Vermont that is, despite the fact that, that we have been on the cutting edge of um, response, our opiate deaths are increasing and we've seen more than we have in years. And um, so um, I am looking at how we can do things differently or how we can expand and um, not, and, and, and I'm, I guess I'll be honest, Deputy Commissioner, I'm hearing from you some um, concerns about even exploring that. I think that we could certainly continue to explore it. Um, I, I definitely don't want to be a person who says we're going to do it this way because this is the way we've always done it. And that's generally not how I operate or the Department of Health operates. So um, we could certainly go back and look at the capacity and utilization in the existing system and identify um, where there might be gaps in the capacity for syringe service programs and how best to fill those gaps. So I don't, I certainly don't want to give the impression that I'm not open to exploring that. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, just to provide um, a little bit more context to this as well, uh, this is an issue that I thought was pretty, you know, important knowing that clients from Bennington were going up to safe recovery in Burlington to receive services. So the idea that, um, you know, that they're readily available is something that I, Question And I do think that the existing definition that limits to um, aid service organizations, substance use treatment centers, and licensed health care providers. Um, in Bennington, uh, the one designated spot was our free clinic. Um, and, you know, because it was a licensed health care provider, it was able to have the standards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but something about the culture or the points of contact that they had with individuals, they were receiving, you know, one client per quarter. Um, you know, it wasn't having that interface. So I think a lot of our reasoning is um, where are the organizations that are having current interface and current points of contact with injection drug users? And how can we think creatively about helping them meet the, the standards of the Department of Health? I understand that that's a concern, but if it's within our, um, you know, within this legislation, that remains the same. It needs to be approved by the commissioner and meet those standards that are set for everybody else. And um, yeah, and one other thing that I wanted to clarify about the peer delivered syringe exchange is that all of the cases that we've seen is not that it's um, necessarily operated or an organization run uh, by peers necessarily, but that it would be an existing organization sets up this program to train and, you know, uh, essentially uh, recruit staff that have lived experience. Yeah. Um, just, to, just to clarify that. And if there's anything we can do in the language to clarify that. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I know Safe Recovery employs people with lived experience, and that's been a real um, benefit <coughs> for the people that they serve. That you know, they really can understand and meet people where they are. 
Cool. Go ahead. You look like you want to say something. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I would just want to, um, understanding that you, um, one of your reservations about opening the door is that you want to make sure that people meet the standards of the Department of Health, but that remains within this language. It just makes yeah. it less prescriptive about who can who can strive to meet those standards. Yeah, understood. And you know, we certainly, obviously, support having um, oversight over those standards. Thank you. Um, and Carl was at number three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, that was number three. We just <laughs> <laughs> and I understand about the working group. Okay, so uh, at five require the Department of Health to adapt emergency rules authorizing syringe service providers to facilitate and support peer delivered syringe exchange. And of course, this goes along with a prior one here about the yeah. peer group. So mm -hmm. I, you probably have already responded to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Carl, I think that may be something that the committee needs to talk about in terms of how, in terms of how far we go or whether um, we start with one piece, which is to widen the definition and ask them to come back with a report or something like that. Thank you. And then uh, I think six was grant programs. Again, there. Uh, it was mainly about mobile medication assisted treatment and mm -hmm. you didn't seem supportive of mobile units uh, because it had been tried and you didn't think it worked very well. Is that your <laughs> Well, um, we're certainly open to it, to re-examining it. It was about 15 plus years ago that this was tried. So, um, you know, we're certainly not opposed to it. Um, and I think we just want to look at what those specific barriers were that were encountered and see if there's a way that it could be that we could sort of plan to address those from the start. So definitely not opposed to mobile medication assist assisted treatment um, in concept, but we just want to be mindful of what barriers there might be, um, you know, heading into that. And, and Carl, if I can think of, I mean, if it is possible, um, I am aware that there, that um, the Howard Center is um, about to embark, they have a federal grant to do it. And um, if I can um, get that person, get someone from Howard Center to, to testify this afternoon um, a, a, as to what research they have, how, how, you know, um, we might, that might help us as well. Okay, just to close out what I was talking about here, I'm just concerned that it seems that there are a lot of areas of this bill at the moment that the, the department would like to do more research on. Mm -hmm. like, okay, and yet we have like 24 hours to <laughs> leave this. Uh, so I don't know if it's premature. I mean, I'm just concerned that, uh, we don't have more support from the department at this point in our decision-making process. So I just like to make that comment. Sure. And if there is a way that it can be, uh, we get more buy-in from the department, I'd be a lot more supportive. Okay. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Um, what I hear, we have some, some at least at this point with this draft, what I hear, we have some potential support or shall we say not whatever is um, to um, remove the quote unquote limitation of the um, definition of um, syringe exchange program and maybe a report back, not to, not to do a peer thing, but maybe a report back. Um, I understand that there is um, a concern um, and, and there is a support maybe not with the money, but their support of the concept of um, looking at um, justice involved Vermonters and, and having grants in terms of that. Um, uh, there is concern or question about pre-authorization 
um, and just and I will share with the committee later or whatever. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is actually in support of the language. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is in support of the um, pre-authorization language. They have a little tweaking about where a sentence days. is. Total pre-authorization or uh, for the 60 day period? Um, they are, um, I sent them the language that was in the um, our draft bill. Um, or actually they said they, they expressed um, support. Uh, they were made some comments and I'm a little slow. So I emailed back and I said, does that mean that you support <laughs> the language as written? And um, I will share those emails. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's, and then and the, I, I believe the department is um, uh, okay with the um, study the evaluation, more information on the, um, what are we calling them now? Um, over, um, what are we calling them now? Overdose prevention sites. The overdose prevention sites. Um, and there, so there's that. And we have, um, when we discussed it yesterday, there was a, maybe we needed to work on that language and I wanna share that language with folks. Did I give, um, have I covered all the pieces? And Kelly, uh, Deputy Commissioner, it, it, is my summary somewhat correct? Yes, it's correct. And also, I would just add that we also support in concept the medication, the mobile medication assisted treatment. Sorry, right, say that again. Okay. They support in concept mm -hmm. mobile medication. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just could I follow? Absolutely. Uh, it sounded like the commissioner had a concern about this in the pre authorization mm -hmm. issue. That if, let's say, we went to that 60 days and at the end of that, it was thought that the person shouldn't have been, uh, what do you call pre authorized? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, what would be the outcome of that? In other words, would the person be taken off medically assisted medication at that point or not? I'm just curious what the outcome of that would be. Another 60 days goes by and a doctor says, I don't think this person should be on this drug, but they have been. So what would be the consequence? I guess that's what I was curious what the commissioner would say about that. Right, right. And, you know, I'm not a clinician. So I, you know, I think that the clinical considerations would have to be taken into account of, you know, what that person's, ex you know, what each person on a case by case basis, their experience was on the medication. I think that if it was deemed to be a successful treatment for that person, I can't imagine that the, the payer would um, deny authorization for it. So um, I think that that's an open question. And it might also be something if you have your, um, if Diva is going to be with you this afternoon, that maybe you would ask them that question as well. Thank you. And just a reminder that for prior authorizations, it's not on the prescriber's end or the doctor. Um, it's the, the payer, as the deputy commissioner was saying. So either Medicaid right. or Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, yeah. et cetera. Thank you. Yes. Um, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, we're, as we've been discussing this bill, um, it appears that, at least to me, um, that there's information um, that was gathered by uh, a group of our committee. Am, am I correct in that? Yes, over the, um, that was you, part of the- Pardon me? <laughs> Uh, yes, that was part of the direction, just as a group over break worked on reach up. Okay. Um, a group. Um, so, and well, I'm was, talking uh, about this one now. Okay. I'm talking so about this bill this. is yeah. Dane. It was Dane and it was um, Taylor and it was Jessica and it was Kelly. Okay. Um, um, whatever information, like that piece that you just came out with, with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, is there a way that we can, the rest of the committee can have that information? Not a just Blue Cross Blue Shield, just... but whatever else is there. I think it would make a big difference in terms of the questions we ask or how we feel 
about the the bill itself. It would be, to me anyway, um, important. So if there is other information, uh, it comes out in bits and pieces as as uh, when the when the agency said, well, we're not in favor of this. And then all of a sudden there's information about it that people have. And, and that's the kind of stuff I think that the committee as a whole, if we had that information, um, it would be much easier for me to make up my mind on what I'm gonna do. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn, absolutely. And in terms of the <coughs> e um, email traffic, um, um, as it related to uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, I will forward that to Julie, who can figure out how to <laughs> send it to um, the committee. Um, the smaller group did meet um, over Zoom with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, over the break. And it was just I realized, Monday. I realized. And Tupper, uh, Representative McFawn, it was just on Monday, and so we just heard back from them last night and a, a follow up this morning. So it hasn't been that long. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Seven fifty nine this, this morning. morning yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm finding out information when uh, different members of the committee start talking about stuff, and I'm saying, "Well, that, I wish I knew that before." That's it's all I'm saying. Yeah, you know we're not um, having a lot of committee committee discussion like I'm used to having, and that's when that stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's and one of the things that um, we talked about, um, sort of process wise, before was an understanding that there were um, this week we needed to do things a little differently. Um, because of how we spent the beginning part of the session mm -hmm. and on very important work. Um, and now we needed to, and that's why folks gave up their um, town meeting recess, um, just as you gave up your summer <laughs> to work yeah. on something else. Right. Um, uh, but I told you about all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things based on conversations um, that we had yesterday about the study language, the report language on the um, uh, um, I believe that um, Dane and Taylor worked on some new language and um, I believe they sent it to Katie, but I don't know if it is in a form that we can um, screen share so people can see it or whether we need to read it. Hi, hi, Ledge Council. Hi, I'm happy to, oops, I'm happy to share it. Just give me a minute to pull it up and I'll, I'll put it on the screen. This okay. is from, from the email, correct? I believe so. Okay, great, let me pull it up. Um, and I wanna do this so that the deputy can, I mean, I haven't read it, <laughs> sorry to say. Um, and so that we all can see um, um, Deputy Commissioner, because you expressed some interest or, you know, in, in that study. And so I wanted you to see where, where the language may be morphing to or not. I need um, screen share capability. You just got it. I, I think you're about to get screen share. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, if you are talking to us, we can't hear you. I'm not talking. Um, <laughs> would you like me to walk through the changes? I wasn't sure if you'd wanted me to do them, I can walk through them and maybe have the uh, members who are working on this sort of discuss the rationale. Absolutely, that sounds like a perfect because some of us can't see the. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, okay. No, no, so, no. no. Um, <laughs> so this is the section five, the overdose prevention site working group. And this is, uh, first we have subsection A is the creation language. And so there's language 
and recognition of the, and then the new language, rapid increase in overdose deaths across the state. With a record amount of opioid related deaths in 2021, there is the working group to identify the feasibility and the new language and liability of implementing overdose prevention sites in Vermont. And then in subsection, should I pause there? I, th I think right now to um, unless there ahead. is, um, I, I will leave it to um, to Dane and Taylor to jump in if they think, or for a committee member, or for that mem or for that matter, deputy commissioner, to jump in if there is a question. Well, I can okay. say, Carl, the liability piece was for you. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. <Thank> you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm listening. I'm listening. Um, the next section is the membership section. There have been some changes here. Um, instead of, um, let's see, the, the addition is a representative appointed by the state's attorneys. And then in subdivision six, three representatives appointed by the League of Cities and Towns or the regional planning commissions. Um, and then in subdivision seven, two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder, including at least one of whom is in the re uh, recovery, one member appointed by Safe Recovery, and one member appointed by the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. So that tracks the language in um, H711 from yesterday. Um, and those are the changes in the membership section. And then um, in subdivision, excuse me, subsection C, powers and duties, this is um, sort of the responsibilities of this group. So there have been some changes here. First, research the current implementation of overdose prevention sites nationally. Second, identify the feasibility and liability of publicly funding overdose, overdose prevention sites. Three, identify the feasibility and liability of privately funding overdose prevention sites. Four, make recommendations on municipal and local actions necessary to implement overdose prevention sites. And then lastly, um, same as the draft you previously saw, make recommendations on executive and legislative actions necessary to implement overdose prevention sites, if any. Thank you, Katie. Would you like this document pulled down? Yeah. So, so th that is hot off the um, hot off the draft press. <laughs> um, so, I, a deputy commissioner, you've seen this as same time I have. Um, but um, you know, we would love, um, we would appreciate your feedback as to what makes um, what makes sense, et cetera. Yeah, I think that the uh, the updated language uh, we could support. It's um, you know I appreciate adding the language about exploring the uh, not only the feasibility but the liability, and then also sort of the um, experience uh, across the country because you know things have changed since um, the OCC looked at this you know four or so years ago. So. Um, I have no concerns about the revised language. Thank you. And one thing I will add about the membership are just a couple of clarifying points. Um, as I believe I mentioned in committee yesterday, I had a conversation with the attorney general's office. Um, they recommended moving it towards a more local approach and having uh, the state's attorney appoint uh, someone to the group rather than having someone from the attorney general's office. Um, we also felt that there was a, a need for more local perspective, whether that's looking into zoning, which is why the suggestion of the regional planning commissions, um, or just uh, municipal level. So looking at League of Cities and Towns did not make a choice on either one of those yet. One, because we have not talked to those groups yet and want to see how they <laughs> feel about um, such an appointment um, and where they might direct us. Um, and two, would love the committee's um, uh, feedback on, on that. Uh, of course, in the two individuals with lived experience, just wanted to match the language that we put in 711 um, and we'll 
show that the providers for medically assisted treatment is consistent with the language in 711 as well. Um, yes, and uh, heard the piece in committee about liability and really want to make that clear, especially when we're looking at funding streams um, and specifically pulling out publicly funded and privately funded because um, in my narrow research so far on overdose prevention sites across the nation, uh, majority if not all are privately funded. Um, and what I'm hearing from communities is that there may be a need for public funding, um, which raises that question of liability on the state level as well. So seeing where the opportunities are there. And later in the bill, when it talked about funding, I think I had suggested we put, there's, there's so much money coming out of the general fund allocated for this. And I suggested or with something that would indicate or other sources of income. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of seven. Seven eleven. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I don't know if uh, Katie picked that up or, or not. Yeah, I'll just say um, yesterday I had a conversation with Representative Fagan on appropriations, and he uh, recommended that since this is going to appropriations committee that we keep it general fund for now and they will make those decisions as far as whether or not to designate it to a different fund. Um, I'm, I'd be happy to get that in writing or something if that would be comfortable for the committee, but I'm open to other ideas. Well, and um, perhaps Ray and I can, <laughs> Ray and I will be going to, to the um, appropriations at 1015 to um, uh, share about 7-Eleven. Um, and I think we did the same thing in 7-Eleven um, and for, for the study committee or the whatever it is. Advisory. The advisory committee. And um, where that led, you know. So, but would you like it in writing, Carl? No, I just thought it would be useful that, you know, maybe there would be even a, a different source than 7-Eleven right now. Oh, uh -huh. I think that's what I'm yep. thinking of that 7-Eleven could be. Yep, exactly. Whether you wouldn't want to necessarily mention it because it's not been approved yet, or we don't have the funds, <laughs> but at least it would be in there that uh, if, if other funds are available, it wouldn't come from the general fund. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe some of this would be eligible for global commitment or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But in a, a global commitment is now a fantasy. Yeah. That's what I'll just say that. There you go. Um, if I could ask one more question, uh, Commissioner Doherty, I was just wondering the final um, sort of pilot about the warm handoffs um, in responding, uh, you know, coordination with emergency response. I, you just haven't commented on that, and I was wondering if you had any any thoughts. Yes. Um, yeah. No. I, I actually am glad that you mentioned this because I just wanted if you could provide just a little bit more um, detail about sort of what the vision is here. It was hard to sort of understand with the way that it's worded now, what, what the vision is for this piece. Certainly I have no concerns about it the way that it's written, but. Um, so um, actually um, that's a, a good question. And I will turn and ask um, uh, you um, if you could, what is the, what is the problem we're trying to solve yeah. in, the, in, in this? Absolutely. Yeah, so I think that the idea is that um, we want the points of contact that we have with people that are at risk of fatal overdose to make the most of those moments where we have points of contact with people. So um, whenever somebody is resuscitated following um, an overdose by emergency medical responders who you know, maybe carrying Narcan to resuscitate them. That can also be an opportunity to connect them with services such as recovery services, treatment services, et cetera. So the vision, this is really based off of one of the community action grants um, that was uh, received in Bennington. Actually, I think it was called the Overdose Outreach Group or something along those lines. And it was pairing up a um, recovery coach to accompany EMS to be on call to respond to um, overdose calls. And basically, um, and understanding that is 
probably a moment where an individual may be more open to receiving care or open to learning more about services after they've had that um, experience. So um, looking to pair up a recovery coach to uh, connect them with services, and in some cases actually make a direct referral to the local spoke um, treatment provider. And there are some technical things involved in that, such as um, memorandums of understanding uh, to be able to, for an individual to share their medical history um, with the other uh, stakeholders, but um, a majority of the funding would go to the personnel, uh, the, the on-call recovery coach, or maybe it could be a treatment provider um, here. So uh, does that kind of clarify? It does. Clarify? And, um, and like you said, there is some work already happening in the state sort of along these lines, but certainly we would be supportive of expanding it um, you know, statewide. We already do have um, emergency responders are leaving behind sort of um, information and, you know, about accessing treatment, connecting with Vermont Help Link whenever they do respond to an overdose. Um, but certainly we would be supportive of expanding those handoffs um, as much as we can. So no, no concerns there. <clears throat> Deputy Commissioner, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm wondering if you could um, work with Representative um, Whitman around, I don't know, descriptive language that, because I think you raised a good point, you know, it's like, really, I don't quite understand what this is. And, and um, <clears throat> sure. Uh, committee, where are we right now? Um, is this a good time to take, we're, we'll be taking this up again this afternoon um, and we're gonna be hearing from Diva this afternoon. Um, uh, look at our schedule. Um, uh, while I, <clears throat> I may need to have a conversation with um, ledge council or whatever, because if we're sort of on a roll with this and we have um, at two o'clock a possible markup and vote of reach up, but I'm also looked on the floor and we don't have a lot on the floor. Um, so we might be able to come back um, and I, want to talk with ledge council because um, <clears throat> there's been a question a, a, around the, um, the the mobile. And so I want to see if we can get um, someone from safe recovery to talk about what they're doing. And despite the fact that I spent most of the um, evening with um, a email back and forth from uh, Vermont cares who wanted to testify um, and I said, please put it in writing and, um, and give it to me. I've, I've yet to receive anything in writing and given the fact that we've had this conversation, I will be um, uh, giving them an opportunity to um, share their concerns um, because, and which may in fact have been addressed um, by the deputy commissioner right now in terms of um, moving in a different direction. But um, since I have not received, I asked for it in writing, um, but it, we were spending way too much time back and forth last night saying, please let me testify um, rather than knowing in case they have other issues. So I will be asking them to, um, if they can testify this afternoon as well. Um, so we can close that loop. Um, I've also received a, a, a amendment suggestion from the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, who would also like to be included in the overdose prevention site working group. Um, so something for us to consider. Moving forward. Okay. Um, 
I'm thinking that even though it's not, um, we don't have a break scheduled until um, <clears throat> 10, 15. Oh, except for we need that break because at 10, 15 is when two of us are leaving for um, that. I mean, I think that, well, let me, um, Topper and others, do we, what other kinds of conversation around this bill right now? We're going to come back to it at one, but before, what other conversations do Madam we want to have? Yeah, Madam Chair, what I would, what I would like Madam to see Chair. is uh, we, we've loaded up uh, people, the deputy commissioner and others, with, with what appears to me is tasks, and I'd like to just let us take a break and um, let let these people uh, start down that road. Because okay. we don't have much time um, yeah. to get this thing done. Yeah. And, and okay. I, I, you know, just just having Katie go over what we did yesterday, uh, it, you know, it's coming together, but there's still some things that, that we need to sort out. And I'd like to give those people time to do that. Okay. Um, I, um, I've appreciated the discussion this morning. I will say that there, there was sort of one thing that um, I felt um, when, when we heard, well, we looked at that 15 years ago or that was tried 15 years ago. I'm like, a lot has changed in the world in 15 years. And I think that there are, um, you know, things that even if we did look at them 15 years ago, how they might be implemented you know, a decade and a half later would be substantially different than maybe how it was done at that time. And um, so I hope that we're open as a committee, um, especially since we are, we in this bill, as Madam Chair has pointed out, um, really are maintaining the authority of the department um, to really be in the driver's seat about how some of these ideas are pursued or even honestly, if they get pursued. Um, I, I hope that we are open to um, keeping them in the bill. I'm just gonna be honest about it um, uh, in some form, um, because I feel like, um, honestly, I feel like it is that what we are doing here are small steps um, to uh, reduce the barriers, to try to reduce the barriers, because I'm not sure we're actually doing it yet, but um, to try to continue to reduce the barriers for um, people who might be at that moment. And I just, you know, echoing what Representative Brumstead earlier said that, um, you know, if 15 people get by on, <laughs> you know, Medicaid, uh, medication assisted treatment that you know maybe shouldn't have but we saved one person because we reduced that time that that's a good trade-off for me um right okay um i think this is then i'm hearing that this is a good time to take a break and we will actually take a bit longer break um to give people some time to <clears throat> to group to connect by email or um by you know zoom or whatever and we will be um back at 10 30. and at 10 30 we will be taking a different topic and we will um be um getting testimony <coughs> around the reach up bill <clears throat> so with that we'll, we will take a break Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.